So, another day, another folder. On this occasion, we've got an Ensign Selfix 1220 camera made by the Barnett Ensign Ross Company in London. Around about 1952, I think, I think the range was 1950 to 1955. It's a wonderful piece of English camera engineering. Six by six folder, takes 120 roll film, I can get 12 frames on a roll. The Ensign Selfix 1220. Comes in this funky little fitted leather case. Also comes with a Kenco lens hood. Clasp fastener, open it up, and there she is. Let's have a good look at the camera. Let's just, uh, let's remove the case. Pop them over there. Just show you a few of the controls. There's not many. This is the film advance winder. This is your scale focus and aperture guide. The back door here, you've got your film counter window and it just says on there 12, which means 12 frames you can get out of a roll of film. On the bottom, you've got a tripod mount. Now to open the camera, you slide this teardrop switch that way, which straight away lifts the Albada finder and it also unhooks the bellows door and out comes your lens mechanism. Look at that. What a beautiful piece of engineering. Absolutely gorgeous. 75mm Ross Express lens. It goes from f3.5 to f22 and the lens is made up of four elements. Now I'm not sure how to say this. The shutter is an, I won't say epsilon, but I've heard other people say it's an epsilon. So epsilon, epsilon, whichever. And that has speeds ranging from one second to one four hundredth of a second with a timed and a bulb mode thrown in for good measure. I've only found one good review on this camera and that's by a guy called Peter Elgar out of Brentwood, Essex in the UK. But his shutter goes from one second to just one to one three hundredth of a second. And if you see there, mine goes from one second to four hundredth of a second. So I get an extra one hundredth of a second shutter speed, which is pretty funky. To set your shutter speed, you just rotate this dial here. There's a little red marker on top there. I don't know if you can see that, just a little dash. And you kind of rotate that around until you get the desired shutter speed. I've checked this camera and the shutter speeds all seem to be working quite, uh, quite nicely. To set your aperture, you've got this little lever and you rotate that. You see the little square cursor and that is where you set your apertures. That's your flash sync port. Right here, you've got your cable release mount. Screw that in like that. Now to set the shutter, you just move this little lever down there. And that is ready to fire. Okay, sadly, this shutter release cable isn't working. So uh, that's a bit of a sinker straight away. You pull that down that way until it cocks. And then now, normal cameras, you've got a shutter release button on the top plate somewhere. This one you haven't. It's the other teardrop switch, which is this side. You pull this switch here for the shutter release. And you see this little, little wire in here? That sort of trips the shutter mechanism. Now there's no rangefinder, no coupled rangefinder, no rangefinder whatsoever on this camera. Basically you look through the Albada viewfinder there, compose your image in this little window here, take the photograph. Now you've got to guess your, guess your distances. You can set it on infinity and hopefully get everything in focus or you can sort of map out your distance with a, with a rule or, or, or step it out. Basically a scale focusing camera and uh, I can't wait to give it a nudge. We're just going to close it up. We're going to take out a roll of, what have we got? Let's see what we've got. We'll take out a roll of FP4 if we've got some. Here we go, FP4. Let's give that a go. We'll take a roll of Ilford FP4, load it into the camera, so I can show you how that's done. And then, over the course of the day, I'm going to go out and take 12 photographs and see what the results are like. So to load the camera, press this little switch here, pops open the back, and there she is. And I think before I put a film in, I might just give that a bit of a clean up if I've got a little cloth somewhere. Let's give the lens a little bit of a clean. I picked it up quite cheap from a local auction site. I think I paid about 120 New Zealand dollars for it, including delivery, which I would say is, uh, is quite a decent little deal. Okay, now to load the film, this mechanism inside there, you press that down all the way, as far as you can go, and it pops out of the bottom there, then you turn it, which locks it in place and that then will allow you to place your film into that top spigot there like so and then it sits in there you can turn that again 
and that then locks in place. Then you stretch the backing paper across, find a suitable slot, and then as soon as we see an arrow come through here, okay, we've got the arrow just coming through there. Now I want to close the back up. I don't want any unnecessary light leaks in there. You open this little sliding door, and that's just designed to keep the keep any stray light out and then you'll continue to wind. Now I'm always a bit cagey doing this because I have missed this so many times on so many different cameras. Let's just get into a bit more light which is not recommended really. You're supposed to do this in subdued lighting but hey that is so dark in there. This is the only downside to winding on through these ruby red windows. They're incredibly dark somehow. I mean this one's just ridiculously dark. Okay we've got something coming through here but I, I can't actually see what it is. Let's see if I can sort of clean that window a little bit. What I should have done is try and clean the window from the inside before I start loading the film. It's too late now. Let's just try and make the best of it. So we've got some arrows coming through, which is normally a good sign. And then you'll see a series of, oh, here you go, here we go. I don't actually think you can see them in there from this camera, but I can definitely see some circles coming through. And I, that's number one. I'm fairly confident. I might have just missed it slightly, but that is number one. So I'll just close the door, keeping the light out. And that guys is ready for frame number one. So we're just gonna have a bit of a drive into town, see if we can get, oh, see if we can get 12 photographs. Look at that, I popped that out without even trying. But that looks pretty funky, guys. That's just a funky little camera. I quite like it. A little bit of history on this camera. They do say that the English or the British made this camera to rival the quality and capabilities of the Zeiss Icon cameras from Germany. And bizarrely, during the uh, Second World War, the British, instead of using their own design cameras, they used the German Zeiss cameras. So there you go, that might tell you something. So obviously to use this camera, there is no built-in light meter. You have to use an external light meter, which I've got. Before we shoot off, I'll just show you the little lens hood. So open the camera up. These side struts are a little bit stiff, so you've got to give it a little bit of a tweak just to make sure everything locks open. And what we're gonna do is grab the little flare hood and simply all you do is pop it on like that. I don't see any way to lock this flare hood on. So basically, if it gets knocked, we lose it. So I'll only use that in specific situations where it's definitely, desperately needed. Other than that, we'll use it like that. Beautiful. All right, time to roll. And also for its age, this case has held up quite well. Quite often the stitching on these cases come loose. Uh, but this is in quite good condition. I've got some neat foot oil. Give it a bit of an oil down actually. Give it a bit of a clean up before we go anywhere. The great original oil for leather. So we've got some leather, we've got some leatherette, needs for oil, got a cloth. Let's give this bad boy a bit of a spruce up. Start on the back face there. This just helps feed and protect the leather. When I take this camera out on a shoot, I won't be using the leather casing, I'll take it out of the leather casing. I find that the casing on these old cameras tends to get in the way a little bit and just slows you down a tad. Which shooting these old cameras is slow enough as it is without the addition of struggling with straps. The press stud on this little casing here pops open so easily and it's another way to lose the lens hood. So uh, I'll have to come up with a way to, to seal that a little bit better. That's the casing done. Pop that away, let that dry. Now for the camera, I'll give this a light going over, we'll start on the back plate. That certainly brings out the texture. It looks quite dull at the moment, but you slip some neat foot oil on and look at that shine. Look at the difference in that. I don't know if you can see it, but I can see the difference. Just be careful around here because we don't want to get any of this oil into the lens mechanism. I might just put a little bit carefully around the bellows. Let's see if I've got a What I'd like to do is put a little bit of needs for oil onto the bellows, but I don't have any Q-tips in the van. So we'll just give this a really, really light going over, just where I can get to. I'm not gonna force anything. In fact, that'll do, because I can't actually get into anywhere else anyway without a Q-tip. So we'll just leave that be, close that up. And that is that. Just give a quick dust off here. There's not much dust on it anyway, to be honest. She is done. So that was a bit of a fail. Looking through the red window to get the, the frame counters, I've missed a load because I couldn't see them. Out of a roll of 12, if I get four or five shots, I'll be amazed. All right, let's get this film out, see how we go from there. 
So to get this film out, you're supposed to push down on the film, which pops out that mechanism at the bottom there, like it does on the other side. But on this side, for some reason, it's just a bit of a drag mission to try and get the film popped out. It might pop out and unravel and destroy what few photographs I've got on this film. So uh, this is a little bit tricky. It's not going too well at all. Is this? Ah, what a pain, what a pain. Looking at the base of this spigot, there's quite a lot of scratches there. So I think somebody at some time has had a real mission getting that out. What I'll do is I'll try and follow suit, pop that out as much as I can, get something under there. Can't do it with my nails. I'll try and pop it out a bit more. Let's go find a tool. Okay, so we've got a spoon. Pop the film down as far as I can. Get the spoon underneath. Hopefully that brings it out far enough. This is not ideal for a quick film change. Okay, we've got it, we've got it, we've got it, we've got it, we've got it. Okay, okay. It has unraveled a little bit. Should be okay. I'm not too worried about losing any of the photographs from here because, uh, to be fair, it'll be shite. Have we got anything? Was that worth it? Well, from a roll of 12, I've got seven negatives. But I tell you what, well impressed. Seven well exposed negatives. They look pretty sharp too. Can't argue with them. Cannot argue with them at all. Who would have thought that? Certainly not me. I expected a load of garbage coming out of this camera, to be fair. Settings for all of the shots was f8 and f11 at 250th of a second. All shots on Ilford FP4, developed in Kodak D76 for 11 minutes. One to one dilution. And to be honest with you, <laughs> I am, I'm over the moon. I'm absolutely buzzing about this beautiful little English camera. She's a belter, she's an absolute belter. Until next time guys, catch you later. Ooh,